Welcome. I see everyone is uh, connecting. Welcome to today's session. Um, next session of our Creative Industries Festival. Um, and the festival in general serves to connect people, uh, researchers, practitioners, uh, students, uh, policymakers. And this panel today on co-curating is really a very good example of this. So before we start, uh, just let me mention some uh, housekeeping. This session is recorded, so in case um, you uh, do not want to be part of it, please switch off your camera. Uh, you can still you know, share questions and comments uh, with us in the chat. Um, the recording will be made available publicly. Um, please also use the chat to introduce yourselves. Um, also give us an insight in your, in your background. We've had quite some lively discussions as well. Do share your questions. We will come back to them uh, after the uh, first half um, and uh, discuss. Um, we will also share the link to a feedback form um, at the end of the session. Please do leave some feedback for us. It's very important for us uh, also for future events. And now I would like to introduce today's uh, speakers, uh, today's panel. Um, I'm so happy to welcome Christiana Payne, the, um, who is Professor Emerita of uh, History of Art here at Oxford Greek University and has also curated uh, numerous exhibitions. She's got one on uh, at the Ashmolean right now, which she's probably also going to mention. And together with Victoria Partridge, she will uh, discuss today uh, co-curating the exhibition Dreams and Nightmares. Uh, Victoria Partridge is Keeper of Fine and Decorative Art at the Higgins Art Gallery and Museum in Bedford. So in conversation, they will share insights with us on this process of curating, uh, the pitfalls to avoid, and also why it is a dream rather than a nightmare. So I'm handing over to you, Christiana. Okay, thank you very much, and, and welcome, everybody. Um, okay, well, we haven't done a conversation like this before on Zoom, so it will be an interesting experiment, but <laughs> we have a kind of list of, of questions for each other. So um, I think Victoria was going to start by asking me a question. Yes, yeah. I was. Yeah. Um, I was. I think, are we starting? We, we've introduced ourselves, so everyone knows who we I are. Think, yeah. Um, but, so we met in the summer of 2016, I can't believe it was that long ago, um, when you came to see some drawings at the Higgins. Um, and together we've co-curated three exhibitions and we have a fourth in the pipeline for next year. So when you came to the Higgins um, that summer, did you secretly intend to propose an exhibition? I, I don't think I did, <laughs> but I really can't remember. Um, I know I wanted to see two drawings. I've known about your collection for a long time, but I've never actually been to see it. And um, there were two drawings I wanted to reproduce in a book and I thought I really ought to see them before I do that. And then I thought, well, if I'm going to Bedford, I want to see more than two drawings. So I made a list of about 10 or 12 drawings maybe. And luckily your um, collection of drawings and watercolors has all been catalogued. There are two big print catalogues. So I looked through to see what there was for my theme, which was trees. And, and then I was really delighted when I went to see you and you gave me plenty of time and you seemed to be interested in my work. And um, it was August too. And, you know, I, I, I half thought you'd just say, oh, well, sorry, I don't have time to see anybody. I'm on holiday. Um, but it, it was really good and we got on very well. And then um, I also saw the exhibition you had on at the time, which was called Beautiful Bodies. And I liked the way, I liked your labels. I liked the way it was laid Thank out. You. And I liked the fact that um, you had a wall with drawings by visitors. So you, you know, you seem to be very community oriented. So I had a very favorable impression of the, um, the museum that first visit. So we got the drawings out, we were chatting, because I love it when people come to visit, um, and you told me about your book and about the tree charter, which I didn't know anything about at all, um, which was going to be the following year, it must have been, that it was happening. Yes. Um, and I think you were doing something with the VNA as well, to do with study boxes, to do with trees. Mm -hmm. And at, at some point, but we don't, we can't remember when, can we? Um, we thought, well, that would make a lovely exhibition. Yeah, that's right. And so, that's how it started. So here is, um, oh. Oh no, technical. No, 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 it's, it's all right. Okay. It's, it's all right. I'm sharing my screen. So this is one of the drawings I came to see. This is by George Price Boyce, a view at Binzi. And this is the other one, a, a very big drawing by John Constable. Um, study of trees at Hampstead. And this is the book that I was just about to publish. Um, 
Okay, so as I said, I've never been to the Higgins before. So Victoria, would you like to tell us a bit more about the museum and your role in it? So as a, I'm the keeper of fine and decorative arts um, at the Higgins Bedford Museum and Art Gallery, and this is it. It's in an old brewery building just behind the high street and just sort of stones throw away from the river. Um, it's a local authority museum. So I think it's probably, as you'd imagine, we've got social history talking about the industries and the people of Bedford and we've got archeology. span but we've also got the Cecil, there you go, archaeology. There's an Oryx skull um, with a hole in the middle of it where some person from whenever has hit it and killed it. Um, so we've also got, yes, here we are, the Cecil Higgins collection, which is fine and decorative arts. Um, it started with the owner of the brewery who, um, oh look, I'm just getting confused by all the pictures, um, who started a collection of ceramics and glass with the intention of opening a museum and he also left an endowment. So when he died, uh, the museum was started, but we also had money to keep buying. So in the 50s and 60s, they started buying decorative arts. So now we have this amazing collection of things like uh, furniture by the architect William Burgess, bits by Morris, Benson. We've got the Edward Borden archive. So we have 3000 pieces from him, who was great. There we go, a great printmaker. We've got a gallery devoted to him. Um, and we also have the Works on Paper collection, which is the reason that we met, um, which was started in the 50s and 60s. And it's an amazing collection. It, it goes up to about the 1980s. Uh, this is some of the exhibitions that I've curated. And we tend to, because we're, we don't have a large budget, our exhibitions, which we have a gallery um, just for the Works on Paper, are, are drawn just from our own collections because it's so expensive to borrow from anyone else but also because our collection is so good that we can just keep showing it over and over again. But Christiana, what about you? Oh, uh, what's oh, your, sorry. oh, there you go. Yeah. Okay. What's your screenshots? What yeah. about you? What's your experience of curating Ashbury, okay. obviously? So I've, 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 um, I was employed at Oxford Brooks for 30 years, but, but I've always liked curating exhibitions and I found it a good way of publishing my research. So I've worked with a number of institutions, um, the Earl Centre for British Art in New Haven, Connecticut, the Genogli Art Gallery in Nottingham, the Barber Institute in Birmingham, um, the Royal West of England Academy in Bristol, and um, quite often working on loan exhibitions. But the one I'm doing at the moment is at the Ashmolean and it's drawings and watercolours by the Pre-Raphaelites from their own collection. And this is the cover picture. Um, and this is one of the exhibitions I worked on with the Royal West of England Academy in Bristol, which involved working um, with an artist. So it's been really interesting working in all these different places, because, for instance, at the Ashmolean, they have it's a huge museum and they have lots of staff. And so um, I've had to start over again and get people to get to know people each time. So I've, they have their own interpretation manager. They have exhibitions coordinator. Um, and a marketing manager. Whereas working with Victoria at the Higgins, um, it was most of the time, it was just the two of us. So it was much more informal. And um, yeah, the, you know, there are advantages in big institutions, advantages in small in institutions, but it's certainly, um, I don't want to be mean about the Ashmolean. Oh, it's, it's been really enjoyable working with Victoria. I'll just be positive. It's been great working with the Ashmolean too, I should say. So, um, I want to say something about the process of collaboration then. So Victoria, had you worked with an academic before and what concerns or worries or fears did you have about our collaboration? Um, no, I hadn't. Um, and we've talked about this before because I I think because I'd never worked with an academic, I didn't know I should be fearful, but I'm, I, I was, <laughs> that doesn't make sense. <laughs> and I wasn't, I didn't need to be fearful because you're great. Um, but I suppose I worried about how you would, what your writing style would be like. I wondered that maybe it would be too academic. Um, I think there's definitely a difference between writing for an academic publication and, and writing for a museum. And I wondered if maybe it would be too complicated and it, it wouldn't go onto to walls brilliantly. Um, I suppose I worried about whether you would um, try and fight me on what wall colour I used, which <laughs> turns out you didn't so that was good <laughs> um and yes I mean if it was going to be extra work if there was going to be hundreds of meetings and you know we were going to have to go over every single tiny thing about it but um none of this happened it was fun 
but but you did you have worries about working with me well author Higgins um I I think I just thought it was a wonderful opportunity because I'd done exhibitions before and I really like sharing my work with the public um I guess you were an unknown quantity so um yeah I I'm a bit sensitive about having my labels rewritten <laughs> which I, I only knew recently so it's a good job I never did anything <laughs> Because I suppose all academics, you know, we like to have ownership over what we write and um, we're sensitive to being edited. So there was that. And then, yes, I, I thought maybe there'd be lots of bureaucracy and lots of meetings to come to. But normally I just hop on the bus and, and come to Bedford and Bedford's a great place to come to from Oxford. You can just walk, walk to the museum. So that was really easy and informal. And um, yeah, it worked well, didn't it? But you were certainly very worried about wall colour. Yes, always. This is our layout and with a walk in the woods um, you wanted to create the effect of going into a wood so you thought dark brown was the right colour and and the way you laid out the, um, the, the the false walls within the exhibition so there was that sense of going into in, into being surrounded by trees um, and then little things like the graphics you had as well I I, I left the um, the appearance of the exhibition very much up to you because you clearly knew what you were, what you were doing and and we did have this conversation I think where you said um well, what about the wall color and I said oh I don't mind whatever you like and, and you were big I never mentioned it again <laughs> just in case you changed your mind <laughs> but, but that again that and that was quite new to me actually because the museums I've worked with before um wall color hasn't been an issue because they haven't been repainted so I don't think I was back in the 90s. I think there's more there's more interest in wall colours now in exhibitions. I think back in the 90s, it was just white. And so it never came up as an issue. So I'd never had strong feelings about it. Oh, whereas um, it, it does tend to be one of the first things I think about. Yes. Yeah. What do you think? Yeah. Mm, trees. Mm, look at the it's fire really, ball It's really, really important. Um, but yeah, now where were we? Right. Yes, yeah, so sorry. It <laughs> it went did, on a um, tangent. Why do you think our, so do you think our collaboration was successful? Yes, I do. I Good. do think it was <laughs> at the end. <laughs> and, and, and why do you think it was successful? Um, well, because I think the Higgins is quite small, so we do have quite small staff. So it we tend to be quite departmental. So I'm responsible for all the art and then there's someone who's responsible for archaeology. So when we're doing, when I'm doing one of these exhibitions, it's just me Um writing all the text, putting the pictures on the wall, coming up with the text for the marketing people. And 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 so I, it takes a long time for mm. just, and you spend so much time wanting your text on the walls to be brilliant that you can't then think about anything else. But with this, because I had you, um, not only did I have the support of having another curator, you know, to go out and talk to people and... Um, just as the sort of the emotional support of saying, yes, this is a good exhibition. So, you know, that was great. But I had so much time to start partnerships with other people. So we worked with people like the Forest and the Marston Vale um, so that we started doing tree identification walks outside. I worked with a great independent booksellers. Um, oh, here we are, who, who created a, a, a list of books that we had in the corner, all to do with trees. Um, we did little tree law on the so all these little interventions of um, little bits about little facts about trees that you can see floating around with the leaves and pointing and no one can see. Um, uh, oh, can yeah, yeah, so yeah, like, there. And that was Just your there. idea, wasn't it? The, the leaves yes. were different, and then little sayings about trees. And I got to work with um, an artist which we'd never done before. That we felt that there wasn't a picture in the exhibition that would speak to everyone that we wanted to speak to to come to this exhibition. So we chose an artist, Alice Petulé, and then put the graphics in. So it was just having this extra time to make the event, to, to work on the events program, um, and to get as many different audiences in and to work with as many different people, which I would never have had if I was coming up with the exhibition all by myself and um, having to do all that research because you already had that amazing knowledge in your head. So, yeah. Well, yeah, I knew about some of the works, others I had to do <laughs> research on. But anyway, um, I, I think one reason why it was successful too was that we, we divided the tasks between ourselves or you, you had a very 
clear idea of, of what we should each do. So I made a list of works I wanted to include and you suggested others. Um, and then I divided them into sections, but then you did the actual layout. So this, this thing here, you did cleverly on your computer. Um, and, you know, I was very happy with you arranging them the way you thought they would look. And of course you knew the drawings because you, you look after them all the time, whereas I just come and see them occasionally. Um, the exhibition was relatively simple as there were no loans. We didn't have a catalogue, sadly, because yeah. I think it would have been quite popular. Um, I don't think we realised until after, did we? No. When people were going, have you got a catalogue? Oh no, didn't even think. No. No, but we but had your book, so that was good. Had, yeah, but that was quite expensive. That was twenty-five pounds. Whereas if we'd had a catalogue that was ten pounds, say, I think we could have sold them. Um, I didn't ask for a fee because I was employed full time by Brooks, and actually I was able to bring some money, wasn't I? Because Oxford mm. was keen on supporting um, my impact, my impact case study, um, and so there was some money for events, for instance, such as this one, which I can't <laughs> remember what this event was. But um, I think another another thing that we share is that we both like making exhibitions that are um can be appreciated by small visitors so yes. things like having the leaves on the <laughs> on the walls um that they could identify and this this particular um watercolor by arthur rackham had fairies in it so they like that and we had things like um tree crown workshops and tree identifications but we had and, and because we had you you could come in and talk to the children um, before doing an activity and then the activity would then be done by an artist in a different area of the gallery so it, it it worked really well because we were completely incorporating the exhibition into our children's activities mm. uh, ah and then ah. one exhibition led to another didn't it yes it did I think we were I was thinking about this the other day I think we were going to go straight into dreams and nightmares Mm -hmm. but uh, we had a, the volunteers and some of the staff in the tea room had this conversation about wouldn't it be nice if we did an exhibition about gardens which was completely led because Walk in the Woods had done so well that this idea of having thematic exhibitions which we hadn't done before um, so we we pushed Dreams and Nightmares into the winter slot and then we had this over the summer but this was a bit different wasn't it because I think I had all the works I'd got a list of works to start off with and then you arranged them and put them in themes. That's right, yes. And, and again, I, I wrote the labels and you reviewed the labels. Um, so that was slightly different. And yes, and here's the layout for that. Careful choice of wall colour again. I know. And, and of course, each exhibition looks completely different. Um, and because your works are not um, digitised, people come into the gallery and say, oh, I didn't know we had this. I didn't know we had that. I know, and it's always, I mean, especially when we get on Dreams and Nightmares, one of the main comments was, are you sure this comes from Bedford's collection? You know, yes. just yeah. no idea that we had it. Yeah, and again, um, you've got your nice little graphics. And just like you commissioned Alice Patullo to do the poster for um, the A Walk in the Woods, you commissioned Charlotte Vokes, is it? Yes, yeah. which again came out because we'd, um, Rachel Rogan at the bookshop had, um, curated this list of books and she did the same again for Rounds Around the Garden. She sells children's illustrations so she was able to put me in contact with Charlotte Vaik who already I loved um, mm. from her children's books and amazingly she agreed to do it and then so we have an artwork, another artwork which again advertised it to a wider community than I think if, if we'd chosen an artwork from the exhibition itself and mm. it could then go on lots of different things. Um, like brochures so and, and yeah. of course having the exhibition in Bedford it meant we could link up with the Panacea Society which is this fascinating museum fascinating society um, who believed that the uh, Bedford was the site of the original Garden of Eden because it is obviously <laughs> <laughs> and and you know there are wonderful works in the collection so for instance this watercolor by Paul Nash in the centre mm. here um, and looked lovely against the big boardings because I hadn't it wasn't until you said that we should have the boardings in the exhibition that because we have a boarding gallery I tend to keep them separate and so they're quite separate in my head and then you started bringing them in and saying well you know you should put Kew Gardens in and so that was a nice way of linking the galleries even further I thought that worked well um oh and then right. our tree 
Uh, do you want to say something about this? We've got some more slides of this later, I think, though, haven't we? Oh, just a quick, the, this again came out of Walk in the Woods. One of the tree crown events, there's a, an artist well, and a puppeteer um, at the theatre Widdishans, so a lovely man called Andy. And he had seen the Rackham in the exhibition and had been inspired to do, to make a tree. So he, it was going to be completely in another gallery, but we said, oh, it would be lovely if you could put it in our exhibition. And he made the, the tree and with the little shed and every single little part of it related to bits in the exhibition. So children were encouraged to find um, like a, a sword in the in this little tree and it would then be in a Burne Jones on the wall. So it was just a lovely link, which again came out of the trees. And I think, again, because I'd never done this sort of interventions in the gallery before, I'd always been quite you know art focused and that's what people came for and I think from Walk in the Woods having had the time to put more interventions in and put reading corners and little bits of leaves floating around you know, this it made me a bit braver then to go even further with the garden exhibition and have this mad tree and, and it appealed to adults as well didn't it because yes it made you look for the details in in the prints and the, the drawings and it, it survived Someone pulled, there's a massive sword in it, and then someone pulled the sword out like Excalibur at some point, but that was it. Otherwise, people were really respectful of it, and I which was, was so the worry. I was worried about it. I, you know, it looked so fragile. I know, and so beautiful. Oh, they were like, yeah. don't touch it. But no, those encouraged you, there's little handholds in the bottom that you could put your hands in and, and feel things. It was lovely. It was such a nice part of the exhibition. And I think that sometimes with art exhibitions, you know, people feel daunted they think it's not really for them they've, they've got to know all about it they've got to know all the different isms of art before they can even go past the door you know but this this made it much more approachable to people and, and I, I like that um ah right ah. and then and then this happened <laughs> <laughs> so this Am is I... dreams and nightmares with different wall colors again yes two different wall colors very important and, and this time we did it differently because we we found we had complementary strengths that um, you really liked 20th century work and um, you, you like dark themes. And I like the 18th, 19th century stuff and had a bit of a weakness for pastoral idylls. And so we decided to, to divide it up so that you would do the nightmares and I would do the dreams. Which um, sounded really good at the beginning, didn't it? Until yeah. then I had to do six months of research on awful <laughs> themes yeah. And Christiana just had a lovely time writing about fairies. <laughs> it's so unfair. And I got the Burne Jones and the Rossetti and, and everything. Yeah, and I got yeah. Keta Colvitz and Edward Burrow. Yeah. So yes, but no, it did. It did work to our strengths. <laughs> and again, I didn't argue about the wall colours. So it was obviously <gasps> the pink for the dreams and the the dark grey for the nightmares. No, imagine if you had. And then oh, this poster that caused problems, didn't it? Yes, it was deemed unsuitable for some places. <laughs> um but funnily we didn't get any complaints about it I thought it was would be good because I'd, I just thought if you had that up in the town as you know a huge AO poster someone would take a double take and think oh then yes I shall go to the Higgins but then it took a turn didn't it when Covid came and it was less it wasn't amusing at all by then so we started oh, taking that's it right down. To on then. yes yes because the yes. last weekend of the exhibition uh, we were closed by I and but that. it it the exhibition then went on longer because we opened during the the last you know bit when lockdown right. lifted yeah but, so it's and too close, too close for comfort yeah too close for comfort by then another thing I liked <laughs> this is this is really sort of personal but but I never asked to have my name there no you didn't you put it there anyway so I put your name in all of them I think yeah and also would... the Oxford Brooks always acknowledged yeah. Yes, and I I was a bit kind of uh, about having my name up, but <laughs> I did. Uh, but it was nice because then when people wrote reviews, they'd go and the two lady curators. <laughs> yeah. Well yeah. done. So that was nice. And here are some of the nightmares. And uh, they're really big. The, the, the Higgins has got some specially important turners and there's one on the left there, which is still yeah. the original frame, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. Which, uh, did you help me put that up? I can't remember. You helped me put one of them Probably. up. Probably. And then on the right, you can see a William Blake watercolour. So, you know, it's really good collection. Um, oh. Oh, there's my chairs. Yep, and it has much nicer chairs now than it used to. 
Yes, I managed, I think from the success of having the reading corners in Walk in the Woods and in the garden exhibition, um, I was allowed budget to buy new chairs, <laughs> which I had, and I made sure I got a cushion that exactly matched very important details. Yes. <laughs> but um, what I liked is that you get comments from visitors saying attention to detail. I'd be like, yes, thank you. Yes. And also we had two rooms this time instead of just one, yeah. which we'd had for the earlier exhibition, so that was good. And we were able to produce a catalogue, thanks to Oxford Brooks, which provided money mm. for it. Um, so, oh, right, yes. So the next question is, um, and that was the first time you'd had a temporary exhibition with a catalogue. Yes, never before. And we'd never be able to do it normally. Um, no. We'd never have been able to afford to have a catalogue. So it was a lovely sort of legacy of the exhibition to be able to have one. So um, what effects did, your, did our collaboration have on your practice as a curator? I think you've probably said some of this already, but... Yeah, sorry, I didn't, I haven't kept a script. Um, <laughs> Bring you up to do other things, certainly, but, but you said something also about um, how it changed your attitude to things or how it changed your approach? I think it changed... It changed my approach to exhibitions. I think I said this a bit earlier, but I think before I'd taken, I mean, exhibitions are serious, so I don't mean that we shouldn't take them seriously, but I think I, I hadn't wanted to put interventions in the gallery. I'd want, and we were doing exhibitions that, you know, had names like vorticism and cubism um, and being very serious. And I think these exhibitions made me realise that that really wasn't the way forward. Um, and Walk in the Woods has become a real model for how I see that we should be doing exhibitions, that you can incorporate so many different community partners and get much more, more people into the gallery by doing the thematic exhibition. Um, and also by having a bit of fun with, with the walls and what you're doing. Um, and I think also your captions, the way that you write has made me feel much more confident in using my voice in, in an exhibition, you know, because you'll, Lots of people talked about the captions and how well written they were. And we hadn't had that before with my captions. Um, but that there was there was facts in there because obviously you're very knowledgeable, but there'd also be something funny in there. Like the one you did for the gardens exhibition, you you picked out a little fact about how people stopped going to the, philosoph was it the philosophical gardens? Mm, because, um, be because of an escape bear, which, you know, most people, if you were being really serious, wouldn't have put that. <laughs> But it was just a lovely detail that anyone would actually want to read because that's the most interesting thing that there'd, there'd been an escape there. And I think I'd been able to do that in the Borden Gallery because there's so much humour up there. But I hadn't felt confident doing it downstairs in the, the Wixom Tree Gallery. So I think that changed. That made me feel more confident from a that's, sort of that's really interesting because, way. Because I... I think I learned from your labels and that's probably what it is. I saw them in the Borden gallery and that also encouraged me to, to put in more sort of humour. And I mean, it's, this isn't very funny, this one, but, but, and, and so <laughs> that by the time we did Dreams and Nightmares, um, I did half the labels, you did half the other half. And yet it, it isn't very obvious. I think that it comes over as maybe one voice, especially I think if you look at these two, um, because we've both used the artist's own words. And um, this is the one that makes you cry, so you better yes. not leave it out. But it, it's a really, really moving print. Um, yes. And I've learnt a lot from doing these exhibitions. I've learnt a lot about 20th century artists I didn't know much about or anything about because I've had to write labels for some of them. And it's made me more confident in writing about someone I'm not an expert on. Um, using your catalogues but also doing reading round round them um, and I have certainly acquired a much better understanding of the challenges faced by curators in small museums because for instance when you hang an exhibition you do it all yourself you don't have any technicians at all no nope. you wield the drill you do the measuring you get volunteers to help you and I, I know I've got my crew well. yeah and and that's it whereas you know, somewhere like the Yale Centre for British Art or the Ashmolean, you know, it's all hung by the technicians. And I remember um, turning up the first, very first time to walk in the woods and you said, are you the sort of curator who just wants to stand and point? What do you want to actually <laughs> help? I, I'm so rude. <laughs> <laughs> but, I think I, did I have you wielding a drill by the end of it? I can't remember. I know I, I was yeah, making I'm very heavy drills. stuff. No, I didn't actually wield the drill, but, but certainly, you know, 
the physical work of, of moving the, the pictures around and putting them on the wall. Whereas somewhere like the Ashmolean, I'm not allowed to touch the pictures and the frames at all. You know, it, it, that, was, that was all part of the nice experience for me. But it is interesting that actually you're completely on your own looking after this collection. It's like your own private collection in a sense. So, <laughs> so <laughs> you, you do have a lot of autonomy, but on the other hand, you've got to do so many things yourself. Yeah. Yes. So it's yeah, it's it's lovely because no one questions my choice of wall colour. Well, sometimes they have, but then they've been proved wrong, so it's been fine. Um, but this is why I've loved our collaborations because I do get that additional support from you, um, and you know because you're you you're so experienced and you've got so much knowledge, it makes me feel more confident in what we're producing. Mm. Um, and so I think if you've got that bit of confidence, then you can produce something even better, I think. Mm. And this is, the, this is the, I think Dreams and Nightmares came about because I think I brought some students to see an exhibition. Oh, and we did you, looking, you brought them to Walk in the Woods, I think, didn't you? Yeah, we were looking at things in, in, the, um, in the store and you brought yes. them out. And, and I think we said, is it a dream or is it a nightmare? Which was the which was one of the things that people said because I think you put them into sections, mm. um, and then I wrote the sections, the darker sections. But some of the the pictures could definitely have been in either, couldn't they? Yeah. There was, you know, and I thought that was good that you were making the choices as well because you were choosing works that I mean, one particular work which I really don't like at all and have managed not to put in an exhibition ever. Yeah, we're not um, going to show that, are we? We're not going to show that. <laughs> um, you chose to put in an exhibition, whereas I'd have gone no. No one wants to see that. It's horrible. That's yeah, not you let, it is. You let me put it in. So that was interesting. <laughs> yes, and then it made for really good tours where I could go. You know, does anyone like this? I hate it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. How could yeah. you like it? And I think if you can say that, that also gives your visitors confidence to say whether they like something or not. Because again, you get over this this being daunted and not being willing to have an opinion um, um, in, in the visitors. Yeah, and also you don't not having to have an opinion necessarily with any knowledge of art are you you can just mm. I mean some of them really are a nightmare and they are which everyone has and everyone has dreams and everyone knows what trees are and yeah you know people yep. can experience beautiful gardens so it's all you didn't have to have knowledge mm. before coming and then this yeah. is our future isn't it yeah. all fingers and toes crossed um when is it it's, it's April 2022 so it's yep. been pushed it's been pushed back a bit hasn't it it's had its dates changed, but this is uh, Body and Soul, which is three of us now, because we've got Dr. Mary O'Neill. Um, here, yes, Mary. Here. Yep. Um, excellent um, wall colours, I think we can all yep. agree. <laughs> <laughs> and it's, it's kind of divided into Body and Soul, but, but not in the same way that Dreams and Nightmares was, or is it? Maybe it is. This is Body, isn't it? Yeah, this is and, and Mary's doing the more challenging bits. <laughs> I'm good at getting people to do the more challenging bits. Yes. So she's doing the nudes. She's got to write about Eric Gill. Yeah, Eric Gill. Christiana's got to write, to write about nice stuff again. Um, what else have we got? Yes, I write about the portraits. But it's, it is going to be, I mean, the whole thing is going to be challenging and we're opening ourselves to criticism because a lot of these images are of women, but of course they're by men. Mm -hmm. so we do have this wonderful self-portrait by um, Ch Ch Charlotte Berman. Charlotte Burnham. Yeah. Um, and we have a portrait of Berta Morisot on the right there, who at least was a woman artist, but it's it's not by her. And so, yeah, it's going to be interesting. Yeah, so it's, the whole thing with our collection is that it's very much is an historical collection. So it's very male, very white man. Mm -hmm. um, and that is a criticism that we have and that we don't have enough works by women artists which you know I wholeheartedly agree with um but I think so there is going to be the challenge of having women depicted by men but that you know that's that's interesting in itself how they depict us um but also there's there is challenging pictures in there um and and nowadays people write about artists like Eric Gill and Gauguin very honestly so we, we've had discussions about that, about how we talk about them and how we can't just gloss over their ter terribleness. 
Well, that'll be fun for Mary. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> I'm very in the need. <laughs> Female nude. Um, I'm really getting my head around some of this. Yeah, yeah. It'll yeah. be interesting. It'll be really interesting. Yeah. Whereas I'm all about the wall colours again. I'm not having to write for this one. So I can just <laughs> okay, I can so concentrate on nice colours. things. So shall I shall I stop sharing the screen now? Or do we want to leave images up there? And then shall we move on to questions and discussion from the rest of the group? Yes, we've had some questions um, and we'll try to answer them all, cover them all now. I will start with uh, Maya's question, who is a research fellow with our network. And she's asking if COVID-19 um, will have a long-term impact on these curating techniques that you described, for instance, tactile objects and children-friendly touchy pieces. Mm -hmm. Could some of the exhibitions um, move permanently outdoors, for example? Um, well, we had a bit of it within Dreams and Nightmares in that we had to change our setup um, when we reopened. So we were going to close. I think lockdown must have happened just before. No, it can't have done. I think we had our last weekend, but people were obviously really cautious. Mm. And then I was going to take down the exhibition on the Monday and lockdown happened on the Tuesday, I think. Um, so we didn't take it down at all we left it open so that when the lockdown, first lockdown lifted, we could have it again. But we had to make changes to it. So my beautiful chairs had to be taken out because they couldn't be cleaned. Mm -hmm. um, the beautiful bedtime stories, we couldn't have those in anymore because again, they couldn't be cleaned. So they had to be taken out. Um, thankfully, the way that we'd set up the space, we'd made it very open. Um, and we deliberately made it open because we found during Walk in the Woods that people liked to do events in there. So we had yoga in there on Monday mornings among, amongst the trees. Um, and we had um, a dissy dancing. So we'd found that having a much more open space was worked really well. So that was good that people could walk around it and, you know, we could do social distancing with it. And then for the next exhibition, it happened again in that I had a beautiful selection of books from Rachel Reagan again, all about clouds and, and under the same sky. And it was lovely. And, and all those have been taken out. Um, we had to distance chairs. Me, and then for body and soul, we've, we don't know what it's going to be like in 2022. So again, we've made sure that the exhibition space is very open. I think for the, for the outdoor question, you know, there isn't a chance that we can do that because we're works on paper so but we are trying to increase our digital offer um and that if we don't know we want to do a, a study day but we don't know if we'll be able to do it in person or whether we'll be able to have to do it on zoom so it's sort of the unknowns i think at the moment for us and that we can have the building open and you know it's, it's covid safe and we've got one-way systems but planning events is really difficult because already we've got groups like U3As asking if they can have tours and we can't do them yet and we don't know when we can do them so yeah events programming is very difficult because it's just so unknown at the moment. I think so. one good thing about the Higgins though compared to say the Ashmolean is that um, the Ashmolean likes doing exhibitions and getting lots of people in who pay and you know they rely on that to pay for the exhibitions whereas all your everything you do is free mm. so although you would like to have lots of people you're not dependent on that no which i mean and we've been very lucky in that we're local authority so there is a bit of safety in there whereas so many other museums have hugely suffered under covid because their income is just completely gone so we've been Incredibly, I mean, we haven't even had to furlough staff. We've just staff have gone off to do other things in different parts of the um, local authority. So working in community hubs and delivering food to people. So we've been very lucky so far. Um, but yes, I suppose it is just the idea of planning mm -hmm. and, and knowing that you're going to have less people come in. I mean, we had far less visitors for during the last time that we were open don't actually know how, how we've done over the last couple of days but yeah it's a planning problem that we just we just don't know and we um, don't know how people are going to feel either I think no I wonder too about because the latest research seem, seems to suggest that 
picking COVID up from surfaces isn't such a problem. It's not a, nearly as infectious as people thought. And no, it's more uh, air, isn't it? Yeah. So, you know, a year ago, people were saying, oh, books in libraries will have to be quarantined for 10 days before they can get back on the shelves and things like that. And, you know, I think um, things change all the time. But but certainly something like the, the Widdishans, the tree, wouldn't be able to have that now. That was so lovely. No, mm. it's very sad. But yeah, we just have to try as many different ways of, of doing things. And mm. I think we have to be much quicker in how we promote things because things change so quickly that you don't know what's going to happen. But I mean, in, in Bedford at the moment, we're struggling. Um, I was going to go into work today to do this, but but didn't because Bedford, I think we're second highest at the moment for infection levels um, with this but new you've variant. you've got the Indian variant, haven't you? Yes. I mean, we don't get mentioned, obviously, because Bedford never does, but, you know, they always say Bolton. But Bedford is, I think, second highest. So yeah. it's... It's, you know, we're being very much encouraged to work from home. So tours are not on the agenda at the minute. Yeah. Yeah. It's really good to hear that Jillian has had, you know, the chance to deal with this new situation in a, in a, in a positive way. Um, you also mentioned um, new techniques and, and strategies you can include in future exhibitions. And there's one question from the audience on your opinion of uh, VR experiences, virtual reality, uh, these new uh, immersive technology um, and uh, immersive experiences, a question I'm very much interested to. So what is your opinion on these new possibilities? Um, I think from our point of view, um, because we're local authority, our computers also all come under local authority IT. So whereas other museums who have um, Apple Macs, so can do very whizzy things, we're very limited into what, what we can do with our technology. Um, we've got Zoom, so that's good. But so if we're doing anything, you, I noticed lots of other museums were doing lots of lovely videos and things, but we, we didn't really have the technology to do that sort of thing. Um, I remember going to watching the Museum Association and, and laughing along that loads of other local authority museums were all in the same situation. Mm. Um, and also I think, I mean, there's budget as well. I mean, Ashmo the Ashmolean did that lovely video of you, Christiana, mm. um, and it had such good production techniques, you know, the bits where you're walking and it's zooming in and out and it looks beautiful. I think we, we don't have the budget to do that sort of thing. So anything that we do, is very um, homegrown and on an iPhone. Um, and I think I'm being a bit rubbish in that I'm not very comfortable being recorded because I usually sound like an idiot and <laughs> would have to take 10,000 takes. But I think in the future, once I get back into the gallery, I'll have to be less rubbish and actually agree to, to do tours and things. But I think from, um, is it VR? Is that, what, is that what it's called? The thing with the headset? Reality. Yes, that's a factual reality. <laughs> <laughs> that which obviously I know loads about <laughs> um yeah I think it's just going to be an issue of budgets and also I mean it is I do still think that people want to see actual art I know it's lovely being able to see things online but it's just it's just not the same um, I don't think I can be the only one that thinks it's not the same as standing in front of you know when you stand in front of Turner's right and back falls mm -hmm. it, I mean it's lovely to see online but I'd much rather be by it looking at it but yeah I don't know what do you think Christiana yeah I absolutely agree because there are all sorts of things like scale and and texture and that I mean there are some details you can see better online if you have a really good image but it's not the same as standing in front of the original no definitely not but I but I think in the future maybe museums can do a combination of of for, for instance for the study days we could have a sort of zoom component but also have people in the gallery because I think it is it is good at getting things across to people who who couldn't travel or you know maybe a house band or whatever I know or, it's so much it's so much more accessible isn't it mm. I mean I found that myself I've, I've never been to a museum association conference because you have to stay overnight and they're very expensive but mm. last year I was able to go to all of it just you know sitting at yes. the kitchen table so you know it's great but still want people to come in too Thank you so much. Um, it's interesting because my own research uh, focuses on digitalization um, in, in a different context where it's more about performative practices. And it's the same thing that artists say. It can be in addition, but never exclusively shifting or substitutes in that experience. 
it's very interesting to hear that from your position as well. So another question by James um, is, did you attempt to reach out to new audiences with your exhibitions? How does Higgins generally appeal to diverse audiences? Well, Bedford is very diverse um, and is known for it. Um, we have lots of different communities that came for many different reasons. Um, people coming from over from Italy for the brickworks and things like that. Um, and of course, we want to appeal to, to all of them. Um, and that's very much our mission is that we, although it's, we've got this sort of international art collection, the Higgins mission is to appeal to all our communities. So I think exhibitions like Walk in the Woods was able to do that because it was thematic and we were able to work with so many different partners that could get our message out. Um, so we worked with the Bedford Borough Libraries, including all the little libraries. We had a day when they planted a tree at Wotton Library, which I completely forgot about um, until I was reading through the notes that, that the exhibition planted a tree. So that was nice. Um, and working with the Forest of Marston Vale. And also the fact that we could offer, because we had Christiana's Oxford Brooks money, we could offer our events and our children's events for free, which is um, which is huge, really. I mean, we've never, our, our charges are as, as low as we could possibly do them. But to be able to offer, you know, artist workshops completely for free for, for families was great. Um, and I think these thematic models of exhibitions and have working with different partners to try and get the word out and to be more inclusive um, worked really well. I mean, we were doing British Sign Language tours and workshops for free. Um, so yes, it's it is incredibly important for us. I mean, one of the things we were talking about when we were chatting about this before is that Walk in the Woods got a huge media reception. Um, and one of the, not, it's not a failing, but one of the things that happened was that because the next exhibition we did was a completely community exhibition that we kind of fell off the radar of, of all the newspapers. And to another museum that might, you know, might've been quite devastating, but for us, it was far more important than we did an exhibition on celebrating the women of Bedford um, that didn't get national appeal, but was so important for all our communities and all the people in Bedford that, that it, it, you know, it didn't matter. Do you have anything to add, Christiana? Um, I, I remember doing something about packs to schools, didn't we? Yes, we did. We went into schools. Areas, you know, hard to reach areas. Yes, with um, we worked with the Forest of the Marston Vale and they went into schools as well. So we targeted certain schools in areas that we when you know more deprived areas I suppose but also areas that we knew weren't coming in so that we would go into schools and do um, assemblies all about trees in the hope that they would come in and that we did packs including um, our leaflet which had all the lovely Alice Pachulo artwork on it and we would give those out to the schools yeah I completely forgotten about that but I don't know how well it worked you know how Yes, it's difficult to tell. It's because there's all audience finder research and things like that and taking postcodes. So you can never be 100% sure how well you've done and how well you've targeted. But I mean, our visitor numbers were good and our feedback was excellent. So hopefully, you know, and all the people that we, we made friends with during these exhibitions that, and, you know, getting our name out and getting them to come back in and working with them again and again, I think, hopefully we're, we're making leaps and bounds in that and when a walk in the woods was on in the other part of the gallery there was the exhibition about the windrush generation yes of course i've forgotten about that yes. so we we have um, a black history panel um and so we often do exhibitions and this one was about the windrush generation of bedford which made for a really nice private view as well because um people coming to both exhibitions it was a really nice night with everyone talking about the different exhibitions and walking into each one it was lovely but yes yeah, so yeah community focused projects is incredibly important yeah. um to us as an organization as it as it should be because we are part of our community 
what kind of um, answers to just like next like the next question that is uh, on audience feedback and how it serves to shape your practice. But in the second part of the question, um, Amaya asks if the official critics' opinion matter more or um, you know, you probably have talked a lot now about community and the community-centered approach that you have, but what is the role of official critics' opinions? I don't think we get official critics' opinions, to be honest. <laughs> be lovely. Well, no, would it? I don't know. <laughs> um, we don't We don't get them, I don't think. And we got into lots of national newspapers, but it was more of a... I don't think they'd actually be. It would be that they'd get our press release, you could tell, and then they would change it and move it around a bit. Or we got in um, things like where to go this weekend in the Independent. So I don't think we we get it and I'm not sure how much we'd listen to it. I think we'd always listen to our audiences um, and we always have, um, oh, are you going to share the, the yes. newspaper? No, there we are. That was exciting. Which as you say, a- could have been just from the press release, release, but it was good. It was good and we'd never had it before. Mm. But no, but, we, didn't, uh, we didn't have critics coming and tearing it to bits. No, that's no, true. I don't think that would. Nice. It was very good. <laughs> but we do have, feedback which we can't we haven't been able to do because we haven't been able to people can't share pens anymore but we would have feedback books where people could say and we do reports every month which go to the borough council which talk about um how well we're doing um and also if there is any criticism and we definitely listen to them i was reading through before this about criticism and the only criticism we got which is always we we have the occasional comment which is about the height of pictures Mm -hmm. um that tall people complain that i hang too low which (laughs) which is really difficult because um you've got to think about how accessible pictures are that you want people you know in in wheelchairs to be able to, to see pictures so yes they are a little low but i'm gonna stick with it i think but yeah um but yes no I read every bit of feedback that we get in our books um and because we have lovely volunteers who talk to visitors that they pass on feedback that they've had um and we change accordingly or we carry on doing something um it's like the the catalogue that we had a lot about could we please have a catalogue for Walk in the Woods? So we we did one for Dreams and Nightmares. And because the study day went well, we did another one for um, Dreams and Nightmares. So, yes, I think what our visitors say is more important. But then having said that, and no critic actually says anything about us, apart from the local paper, and they're always very nice, so that's fine. Yes, yes, it's interesting, isn't it? I know with, with um, the Royal West of England Academy, um, they have recently been getting more national interest so that um rachel campbell johnson in the times been reviewing the exhibitions but um yeah well it's quite in a way it's quite relief not to have to worry about the, the critics because they can be very damning can't they but i think they would have liked the exhibitions if they had come yeah i mean they were really well, nice mm freedom then as well for you as, as curators. Christiana, one last question uh, for you. How do you evidence your research impact through the exhibitions? Oh, right. Well, it, you'll be able to read my impact case study, I guess, because they'll all be published. But um, yes, I, I did use the um, the comments book, definitely, and quoted some of that and uh, social media as well. Um, visitor numbers. Um, Mary went and interviewed um, Victoria and <laughs> so Victoria <laughs> is is quoted in the in the impact case study um, saying things about how it had um, helped to I, I don't know what you said now well Mary might remember <laughs> um, we chatted there was a lot of laughing I remember yeah, that yeah but how to, how to change your approach to curating and how it had helped you to get more national recognition and how sales in the shop had increased and visitor numbers had increased so oh, yeah the shop so that kind of thing. And then I suppose the very fact that one exhibition was followed by another was evidence of, of impact. Um, yeah, but my impact case study, it was, it was about the exhibitions in Bedford and also the exhibitions in Bristol. Um, so in each case, I was using a mixture of evidence. I don't know if Mary wants to say, and Mary actually, 
Oh, yes, yeah, sorry. Mary edited and wrote a lot of the impact case study. I should I should mention. Do you want to say anything about that? No, I just uh, I was just going to say, apart from the uh, copious gales of laughter, which we both enjoyed, um, there was a lot of useful information that emerged from the interview, which which uh, I think when we were talking, Victoria, you said you hadn't done thematic exhibitions before, whereas Christiana had done a few uh, and it was a whole approach to exhibition um, curation, which was new to you. And you found that it was a very it was a good way to go for your audiences. Um, and obviously the statistical, the, the quantitative information was was quite significant, I think. So it was a really nice mix of qualitative and quantitative um, evidence. And I think the longevity as well, the fact that there was a cycle of three exhibitions is, uh, you know, it proves that the actual, you know, the, the combination worked uh, for the person, uh, for the Higgins um, Bedford and for the curator and for the wider audiences. It was a good combination. So. You know, there was plenty of material there to evidence a, a successful collaboration, which is certainly what we're hearing, I think. Um, but yeah, yeah, I will put my mute button back on. <laughs> I do look forward to co-curating definitely in the next exhibition. Greatly looking forward to it. Yeah, I think we're going to have fun. Yeah. Amazing. Thank you so much for all uh, this um, uh, thoughtful and, and really insightful uh, discussion. I really enjoyed also that you shared your personal experience so much with us and it's such a wonderful example of how these collaborations uh, can work and, and be so successful. Uh, so thank you so much. We hope you've enjoyed this event and that you're also going to join us for more of the events coming up this week and next week. Uh, our week four focuses on, on music and sound. So please do check uh, the program. We also have a screening of um, the documentary Do Not Bend tomorrow uh, online and for free that is focusing on uh, Bill G as a photographer um, and his um, uh, great work there. And on Friday, we have a selection of different scholars from Oxford Brooks in uh, different fields who are part of the research network um, joining us and presenting their work. Uh, so you can also find information uh, on that uh, on our website. Uh, please fill out our feedback form. It's really important for us um, uh, to, to hear how your experience was and um, if there's anything we can improve. And thank you so much, Victoria and Christiana, for uh, joining us, for um, sharing your experience and for, for giving us some insight how important wall colour actually is. I think that gave us all a lot of take away. Thank you so much. Thanks very much. Everybody, Thank you. Come in. yeah, and do come see Body and Soul next year. Yes, if, do. if you haven't been to Bedford, it's a great place to visit um, because you can walk from the bus station or the train station straight to all these wonderful museums. And the Higgins is just a, an absolute joy to visit, and everyone's so friendly. I mean, I was, I love going there, and it is the site of the original Garden of Eden too. Don't forget that. Yes, don't forget that. That's the most important thing. <laughs> Another thing we will definitely take from this session, and I think um, a lot of people actually uh, feel like visiting Bedford, as we can hear in the chat really? right now. Thank you also for the participation in the chat and all your comments and questions. Bye-bye. Thank, okay. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.